The Ramsey County Board of Commissioners is now called to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Brabham? Here. Uh, Modest Castillo? McDonough? Here. McGuire? Here. Ortega? Here. Reinhardt? Here. Carter? Here. Thank you very much. We'll all stand. <laughs> Called you out, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. The agenda of our July 20th meeting is before you. Is there a motion? And a second. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on our agenda? If not, would our brand new clerk please call the roll? Um, Ortega? Aye. Reinhardt? Aye. Bratham? Aye. Modest Castillo? McDonough? Aye. McGuire? Aye. Carter? Aye. Thank you very much. The minutes have passed. I'm sorry, the agenda has passed and the minutes are before you. Second? Second. Thank you. Um, is there any question or discussion on the minutes of July 6th? Would the clerk please call the roll? Okay. Ortega? Aye. Reinhardt? Aye. Brother? Aye. Maris Castillo? McDonough? Aye. McGuire? Aye. Carter? Aye. Thank you very much. The minutes have passed, and I have the opportunity to call on Commissioner McDonough for a very special proclamation this morning. And we have uh, honored guests in the audience who will join us at the front, please. And thank you so much for being here for the proclamation this morning um, on pretrial, probation, and parole week in Ramsey County. <laughs> Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, as I was getting ready to do this proclamation, I was thinking, I think in my 21 years, we've done this proclamation for 21 years. It might be the only one that we've done my whole time I've been a county commissioner. And over the years, I've had a number of uh, pro I've been privileged to do this a number of times. I think all of us has probably had a, a, t a, a rotation in on presenting this proclamation to all these good folks behind us, but there's a whole team behind you folks mm -hmm. that really work for us in Ramsey County and work for our residents as, as they get into a little crisis sometimes and they need <laughs> some help, right? And we got good people there. So um, I'm going to read the proclamation and then we'll uh, get some folks up here to so you can share with us, you know, the, the work you've been do doing over the last year since you've been here p before. So with that, Madam Chair, with your permission, I'd like to read the proclamation. Whereas since 1999, the American Probation and Parole Association has designated one week in July to honor the women and men who serve as probation officers, assistant probation officers, correction program workers, and support staff who work to improve outcomes for justice-involved individuals and the public safety of our communities. Whereas Ramsey County employs over 500 full-time and intermittent staff who are committed to the mission of paving the way for safe and healthy communities through interventions that promote personal change and accountability. And whereas the operating principles of the Ramsey County Community Corrections Department are helping people change, offering opportunity, providing accountability, and ensuring equity. And whereas the probation officers and community correction staff at all levels carry out the tasks necessary to protect the community, promote positive behavioral change, increase healthy development, hold probationers accountable, 
and provide support to crime victims by helping them understand and exercise their rights. Whereas our probation officers in Ramsey County provide a number of essential services in the interventions, including the investigations for the district courts, community monitoring, intensive supervision, risk and needs assessment, cognitive behavioral programs, employment referrals, mental health counseling, residential and correctional programming, re-entry services, and an array of other services. Whereas Ramsey County community correction staff continue to work in close partnership with community members and agencies to promote race and health equity for our clients and advocate for more community and less confinement. Whereas during the state of emergency with the COVID-19 pandemic, Ramsey County community correction staff rose to the challenge, overcame obstacles and courageously worked to restore trust and create hope. Now therefore be it proclaimed, the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners declares July 18th through 24, July 24th, 2021 as pretrial probation and parole week in Ramsey County. So, I know we've got a speaker right here. Gloria. Gloria. Yes. Yeah. I'm the first I'll give you that. Oh, Someone can hold you. that while you're speaking, and then we'll take I a picture so at the end. Thank you so much. Good morning. I'm Gloria Lamphere, the Juvenile Probation Intake Supervisor. Um, thank you, Chair Carter, Commissioners, County Manager Ryan O'Connor. Um, and Director Clavens and all of our multiple staff. And um, thank you, uh, Commissioner McDonough. Okay, it is with great honor and respect, respect for our Ramsey County Community Corrections professional men and women that I accept this proclamation for the week, for the work we do 24 seven to keep hope and justice alive for our clients, community and all races of, and ethnicities. We collectively represent Ramsey County Community Corrections and Public Safety. Corrections officers, probation officers, parole officers, assistant probation officers, mental health professionals, case managers, administrative and support staff, cognitive skills and community programs professionals. Thank you to my team, the Intake Juvenile Probation Unit for your professionalism, leadership and support and providing court services, investigative court reports, community safety through EHM. You all, all of us, your work collectively provides public safety for our communities. We recognize you, acknowledge you, professionals in Ramsey County Community uh, Corrections Facilities and JDC for providing food and basic needs, medical and mental health services, cognitive programming, officers working first, second, and third shift, working with law enforcement professionals, completing risk assessment instruments, admissions, bookings, releasing, releases, supervising and monitoring pod living units, our community, making it a safe place where all can thrive, fostering positive youth development, promoting, promoting hope and healing. Thank you adult and juvenile probation for assessing our clients' needs and risks, working on the front lines and in, probation, in the fields of probation, using motivational interviewing skills to provide case management services, valuable resources and opportunities while promoting public safety in our communities. Thank you, our adult probation center, reentry and parole staff for our safety uh, you provide in our communities as well. Each one of you bring hope and healing to our community through our service, time, and commitment to clients and their families. We will continue to collaborate and engage in community daily to help our clients lead productive lives and keep our community safe. We express our sincere gratitude for your dedicated leadership, commitment to service to our youth and adult families, justice partners, and also our community. 
On behalf of all correctional staff, support staff, supervisors, administrators, community programs, and our clients, the community, friends, and families, we accept this proclamation. Thank you. Wow. Madam Chair, Commissioners, Gloria, thank you very much for those great comments. Uh, she said it all. I, I have a list of things, too, but Ryan knows I get a little long, so I'm going to try to keep it short this morning. Um, I'm just so proud of this team. They do incredible work. And what you see here is about 2% of my team. We got 98% that uh, continue to work in this department uh, with over 500 staff. We're an integral part of the health and wellness service team, working together, I think, more now than ever, trying to help the people we serve, the residents of Ramsey County. Um, regardless of how our clients come to us, we're here to help. We're here to serve. We're here to, to provide that hope that Gloria spoke about and trying to really support everybody that uh, we work with. You all know we've been on a path of reforming and transforming um, the services we provide and working together with our justice system partners. And I want to say our community. Without our community, we couldn't do this work. There's no way we could resolve all the challenges and all the struggles without the support of the community members that back our work and the engagement that we have um, and continue to have uh, as we go forward. Um, we also support a lot of preventative front end services too and, and uh, work to keep people out of the system, which is probably the best solution before they get into the system itself. So that is a huge part of the task and the goal that we have. And I know now more than ever, um, the hope star we talk about, the shining hope star is so critical and so important with this pandemic that we've been through. And I was just in a meeting yesterday with my team at the RCCF, the Ramsey County Correctional Facility, proud to say that uh, both JDC and our RCCF, we had no uh, ongoing infections of, of clients that we served in those facilities. That wasn't true across the country <laughs> or even in other parts of Minnesota. The, our team did a fantastic job. Gloria was part of that JDC team for many years as well. And so I just want to say uh, to our field services staff, our facility staff, all of the support staff across Community Corrections, it's been tremendous work. Um, and if your shining star isn't shining anymore, I'm going to give Commissioner McDonough an envelope with some right. stars well, to pass though. along to all of you. And those that don't have them, Sammy may not have one. So please wear the star proudly and uh, know that we provide hope each and every day. Um, Madam Chair, with your permission, I might just ask everybody to just say their name and where Thank they work. You. And uh, we'll wrap it up with we'll that. So. Yes. Thank yes. you, Commissioner. Thank you so very much. And we would appreciate it if you can circle around yes. and share with us who's here with us. We know that you're 2% and that you're going to take the message of thank you and appreciation back to all. Absolutely. Thank you. Raphael Washington, uh, Ramsey County Probation, Spruce Tree West, POR unit. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Alix Herzing and I am a planner in the juvenile division. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Derek Jackson. I'm a supervisor of supervised release, Spruce Tree North. Thank you. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Kovacs. I work as Spruce Tree West, probation officer. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Joseph Arvidsson. I'm a planning specialist in our transformative services unit. Thank you. My name is Cha Vang, uh, working as a PO with Probation Service Center. Thank you. Gloria Lampier, supervisor with Juvenile Probation Intake. Thank you again, Gloria. Agustino Cruz Almodovar Carasquillo Maldonado, Probation Officer Spruce in which uh, center, uh, my charge with all non-speaking English on the Ramsey County. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, good morning, Melvin Robinson, um, Plato Office, uh, Young Adult Offenders Caseload. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Mark Elliott. I'm the supervisor of the Predatory Offender Unit at the Spruce Tree Building. So thank you. Thank you. I'm Jordan Switzelzer, Probation Officer at the JDC. Thank you. Uh, Sharonda Minor, Assistant Probation Officer at JDC. Thank you. And that is everyone. Thank you so very, very much. Can you get the taller folks in the back and then we can get a nice picture? I wasn't going to get back there, but I figured. I don't want to be You're going to have to hold that. You're going to have to hold that. You're good to hold this right in the middle. Okay, so that was good. If 
Ready? Come on in. Thank you. A very lovely picture of the breadth of work that you do every day across an entire continuum of services. Thank you for the help that you provide for our youth, for our adults, for our families, for our community, for all of us. And we'll finish up with a couple of comments from our county manager who would like to share some thoughts. Thanks, Madam Chair. I just wanted to give a shout out to the unit um, as, as we, a year ago, were reading every single week service delivery forms on what is happening to our services during COVID, who's being impacted, what are we most concerned about, uh, this area was one of those that stands out to me for the degree to which they were concerned about losing contact with people in the community um, and losing the ability to continue to be in relationship with people on their journey. They were worried about technological challenges, hardware challenges, the barriers that were being put up by a pandemic and the amount of work that went in reading every single week, the efforts to break through those barriers, which are structural and systemic and in no way easy to do. I just want to say thank you to everybody for that and know that it was noticed. I swear I read every one of those sheets and I'm glad we're not doing them every week now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Commissioner McGuire. when I was in the legislature and the work that you do is just such an exemplary model of what it means in this in this state so I know that others can learn from you and I'll tell you if you ever want some hope in your life go to a go to a meeting or go to a, a conference on, on CCA because they talk about you know the prevention the early intervention the transformation the reformation you really live that talk and I just can't thank you enough for for being a, a model in our, in our state and, and for our residents. So thank you all for that work. So I'm sorry that I let you go back to your seats, but I know <laughs> that you know all these comments are for you. I'm turning to Commissioner Reinhardt. Yes, I also wanted to say thank you. Um, when Ryan was reading off all of the things that had been done a year ago, and when you think about the fact that there was so much more to do because of COVID, not only did you step up to the plate, but you hit a home run. Um, transforming systems, yes. Transforming individuals' lives, individual families, and, and then as a whole, the community. Um, fantastic work. Thank you so much. And I know that with all the changes that we have, that it has been, um, even if we hadn't had COVID and the civil unrest and all of that, um, I think in community corrections is where it is the fundamentals have to change there and focusing on prevention and the other things that you had mentioned. So yes, it is very much noticed and thank you. Thank you very much on behalf of all of us for the sincere work that you do for all of our communities. All right, and we are going to move on then. I'll turn to County Manager O'Connor for our COVID update. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll ask Deputy County Manager Kathy Hadeen to come up to be prepared to share more. I just have one update we'll lead in with as we continue to look at our own emergency order here in Ramsey County and the need for it to continue. I wanna be clear, an emergency order is both a bureaucratic exercise about tools available to respond as much as it is about recognizing COVID. COVID is still a part of what's around us. Deputy County Manager Hadeen will talk about the Delta variant and continued ongoing concerns we have, but we are preparing for August 3rd to bring a request for board action to the board that would uh, end the current emergency order declaration here in Ramsey County. So I wanted to highlight that for the board. Um, I wanna thank public health for working with Homeland Security Emergency Management and through the incident command structure to ensure we are not giving away any sort of rapid response tools that we need while also recognizing when it's appropriate to wind down those tools and move back toward a traditional governance structure. And then finally, it's important to highlight 
um, the work finance has been doing, through particularly in procurement, to learn from the good that has occurred so that we can leverage those benefits along the way as we move forward. More to come in a couple of weeks. With that, I'll turn it over to Deputy County Manager Hadeen. Thank you. Welcome, Deputy County Manager Hadeen. Thank you, County Manager O'Connor. Good morning, Chair Carter and Commissioners. Um, as uh, alluded to by uh, County Manager O'Connor, the Delta variant continues to be um, of concern to all of us. I think um, as you read and learn about what it's doing across our world and across our nation, um, unfortunately 99% of uh, deaths that have occurred among, among unvaccinated and 97% of hospitalizations recently across the nation have been among people who are unvaccinated. Um, we can move over to the dashboard and we'll briefly go through um, a few highlights of what's on our uh, data dashboard and our vaccine dashboard and then uh, I'll turn it over and, and give an introduction to who's next. Um, yesterday there were 101 people hospitalized and 20 people in critical condition here in Minnesota most of which um, have not been vaccinated. So that continues to be the story, unfortunately, and the data and, and continues to be where we put our energy um, in community. Um, vaccines, though, continue to be the good news. And so as we scroll down, you'll see the daily cases and you'll notice, you know, June, uh, we were in the single digits. Um, July, we're starting to move up into the double digits. You know, it's um, nowhere near the hundreds of, of cases that we saw a day over in October, November, December, um, and early January. And it's certainly not um, what LA County is seeing, which is a thousand cases a day, which is why they brought back the mask mandate, um, which is very important, um, but it's still worrisome. And so um, as the Delta variant of, of COVID continues to Go through our communities we're paying attention um, and aware of how highly contagious it is so if we scroll down a little bit more um, yesterday's in the state of minnesota um, the state was reporting a two percent um, seven day rolling average positivity rate and as of july 3rd because we're always a little lagged here with our with the data coming back into our community um, we were at 1.2 percent so still low it means that our community is doing a good job of vaccinating um, and we still have uh, room to go, but if we go over to our vaccine uh, data dashboard, we'll see that 73% of, um, it's actually 72% of our residents 12 plus have received at least one dose with 67% with two doses. The 16 plus, and we still track that because we know that not everybody's getting Pfizer, um, but Johnson & Johnson and um, Moderna are for 16 plus, that is at 73% um, of our residents with at least one dose of COVID-19. As you know, the map uh, with social vulnerability index is updated weekly on our site. Uh, the three zip codes that we've been working hard in, uh, 55103, 55130, and 55106 continue to increase with 103 and 106 at 64% uh, vaccinated and um, 130 at 61%. Uh, Sarah Holly will uh, address kind of the move of where those zip codes have been uh, shortly. More than 53,806 doses have been administered to 283 clinics um, here in our county. So if we want to move over to the clinic page, I'll highlight a few clinics that are available for our community to attend and some pop-up clinics as well. This week, our plan is to vaccinate 350 people um, at clinics at Harding High School, uh, today, Washington Tech tomorrow and Arlington Hills Community Center on July 22nd. Uh, Oxford Community Center on, Ju on July 24th, along with a few uh, more locations. We have found that the school locations are actually bringing in quite a few students and their families. Um, we have a lot of students who are in a summer school and it's been a good opportunity and a good partnership to um, make sure that families and young people have access to vaccines. So that's been um, a positive experience um, for everyone involved. Um, if you want, you know, you can visit www.ramseycounty.us slash COVID and click on the COVID-19 link and vaccine information uh, and clinics for more information there on where you can find a pop-up clinic. Um, next, I do want to invite Prince Corbett, Racial and Health Equity Administrator, um, along with John Sigeland, our Communications Director and Incoming Public Health Director and Racial and Health Equity Administrator, Sarah Hawley, to the podium to talk about where 
how we're connecting with community, um, as well as how we're messaging with community to get those who want vaccine uh, the opportunity to get one. So Prince, I think I'm handing it over to you. Uh, thank you, Deputy County Manager Hadeen, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Uh, we wanted to provide an update with regards to um, our racial equity and community engagement response team with the COVID-19 vaccine culturally specific and uh, focused vaccine initiative that started nearly a month ago. Uh, so this approach that we uh, developed uh, to have culturally specific and focused vaccine initiatives is really a three-pronged approach. Uh, one is uh, culturally specific media messaging, so making sure that we are reaching our diverse media partners through target media messaging services. Um, the second prong approach through our trusted cultural community uh, connectors with targeted vaccine education, outreach, um, and connection to sites, as well as making sure that recognizing that some individuals in the community are still hesitant about the vaccine and making sure that we're also sharing information as well around uh, staying safe and uh, protecting everyone during, for those who chose, choose not to get vaccinated. And then the third pronged approach is our culturally focused uh, vaccine distribution, which is focusing uh, community uh, pop-up vaccine sites. So understanding that some people in our community may not want to come to a government building, a government site. So going out into the community to have a uh, vaccine site set up. Uh, with research and partnering with our St. Paul Ramsey County Public Health Department uh, about a month ago, uh, really focused on these target audiences. Um, as Deputy County Manager Hadeen has shared, focusing on the 55130, 55103, and then the 55106 zip codes. And then with our culture, our diverse residents around American Indian, our black African American, aid also American descendants of slaves uh, residents. Um, African born and with African born it's also important to make a distinction that we were looking at our East African uh, immigrants as well as our West African immigrants understanding that there are differences within those communities so uh, like Kenya um, focusing on our West African immigrants and then Ethiopia Somalia and Eritrea um, as far as East African immigrants and the same with regards for our Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, residents as well, making sure that we are focusing on our Korean and Hmong communities and making sure that we are not just uh, lumping all of our Asian residents together. Um, and then with our Latino residents and then our youth and young adults who also have a different need for messaging because they don't read the same things that we read all the time. So making sure that we are being diverse in that. And I will now turn it over to Director Sikvalin. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Good morning, Madam Chair, members, guests. Uh, I am going to provide an update this morning on our work around working with our advertising partners and our uh, cultural um, publications and partners to get the word out on this. So using a budget of $300,000 with an emphasis in June, we've been doing a lot of advertising, um, to targeting those zip codes that Prince and uh, Deputy Manager uh, Hadeen mentioned, as well as um, working with those media outlets that reach into specific communities. And so we've, we've um, used about a little more than two thirds of our resources. We'll continue this program through July. So if you are a resident of one of those zip codes, um, you're really being seeing this message in all kinds of forms. So digital, the, the social media channels you use. If you uh, pull up to a gas station, you might see an advertisement on the gas station advertising, billboards, transit advertising, on the apps you use like Spotify. Then we're, we're broadcasting and using media partners on radio, uh, some of the, the outlets here are here on the screen, and then news outlets, both print, print and di digital, excuse me, where you'll see um, banner ads and a number of advertisements carrying these linguistically specific, so translated messages that lead back to the web content that we've been developing and talking to you about over the past year or so, where we have resource pages dedicated by language. And this targeted and integrated campaign is leading people back through all of these various ways into those sites. And the uh, outcomes here are what we've got so far. So this is data uh, to date. We'll have a complete recap when we close the campaign. But to date, you can see very encouraging, closing in on 8 million impressions. Uh, this is views, doesn't include radio. We don't have that yet. We'll have that for you at the end of the campaign. And then the click-through rate, you can see that here. Uh, effective use of digital billboards. And then the third bullet down shows you the increases in traffic to those uh, specific language pages we have. And so some of them very dramatic, you can see, especially Spanish, driven a lot of traffic to that page. In just a short period of time, using these additional resources, 
building on the messaging and the work that we've done previous to this. So those messages, you can see a couple of the digital ads off here to the right of the screen. And the messages started in June, in June really focused on free, safe vaccines. And then in July, we have pivoted to the community connectors. And Sarah is going to share a little bit about that now. Good morning. Good morning. Madam Chair, Commissioners, County Manager O'Connor. Thank you, Director Siglin and Administrator Corbett. Much appreciated. Um, and by the way, Director Siglin, I heard an ad on KMLJ last evening around the connectors. So that's wonderful to hear that we're getting this information out into community. And so as mentioned before, we um, launched our Trusted Cultural Community Messenger and Connector Initiative um, at the beginning of June. And to date, we have put approximately $375,000 out into community, which we're really grateful for. And as Prince mentioned, these contracts are really around our trusted agencies and community members that we've been working with. Um, and we also have some new partners, which is really wonderful that we can continue to grow our network and grow our relationships with the community. The focus here has really been around education and outreach and engagement. Um, and as um, Prince mentioned earlier, really targeted approach. And so um, we've, we've kind of pivoted in a way that we're actually extending the time period for the scope of work to be implemented because we're learning from community that people need more time. And that's the feedback that you'll hear later on at the board workshop from research and food and basic needs. And so we're really grateful that we do have these key partnerships that we continue to build now and through the end of August. So just really quickly, um, if you haven't seen the wonderful um, poster that Public Health put together where you have a QR code that you can scan and get information around clinics in the community, we're, we've been sharing that out with our community connectors. They've been picking those posters up from Plato and really love the information that communications and research have put together for this um, campaign. And as I mentioned, we're really trying to leverage those community strengths, as we said before, those trusted community networks. Um, and really complement and enhance the work that public health has done for some time now through our community members. Um, as Prince has mentioned, we're really focused in on those zip codes, that 55130, 55103, and 55106 zip code, along with our um, cultural communities that uh, we've been working with for some time. And so I think that this phase three work of research um, is really shining a light on where we continue to try to pivot and also work strategically with community. So really quickly, we wanted to give you all an update on our community partners who we're working with. And so as Prince has mentioned, we're working um, with our African-born communities. And there's a list of um, wonderful partners that um, are, some of them are actually new partnerships with research. So we're really proud about that. So you'll see the Somali Medical Association, the Somali American Network, our Romo Community of Minnesota, which has been working with public health for some time, WellShare International, Restoration for All, and the Minnesota Dow Institute. We're also very happy to say that we have a contractual relationship with the Division of Indian Works here in St. Paul. We've been working for some time to get that built up. And so shout out to St. Paul Indians in Action for that relationship and us not giving up on, on that partnership. And so we're really excited about that, um, along with our other partnerships we're seeing in our Asian community, um, um, you know, Hodge United of Minnesota, um, District 4. Dayton's Bluff, we brought a number of our district councils to the table, so thank you for that information. Many of our commissioners here have shared connections there. Dayton's Bluff, we have District 2, Greater East Side, Community Council, of course, Hmong Healthcare Professionals and Hmong American Partnership are working with us. In the Black and African American community, we've partnered with District 5, our Payne Phelan Community Council, Generations to Generation, and in our Latino Latinx community, we are working with CLUS, which has been a longtime partner of Ramsey County. And then with our youth and young adults, we're working back with Macklemore Holdings and the Black Tech Guy. So this is excellent. So we just wanted to give you all an update on the partners. The types of activities that we're implementing are really important to call out. Um, and John's talked about the cultural messaging um, and information that we've been sharing. But um, I think it's also important to point out that we do have partners that are doing that culturally specific outreach and community. They're trusted individuals, they're trusted agencies. And so we're really relying on them to aid the county in sharing that information around vaccines and encouraging people to go out and get their vaccine. One thing that we're also learning is that this dialogue that people are having, they're getting their questions answered. And I think that's really important as we think about the peer education model. Um, that people have a place and space where they can have real dialogue about their questions and concerns about the vaccine. Um, we're seeing radio PSAs, so we're kind of doubling down there, which is wonderful. Um, sharing information on social media sites. 
um, folks are still hosting virtual discussions within community. And we saw that with our community conversations that were hosted this past fall and winter. Um, and the biggest thing is access, right? So we're having folks, you know, transportation coordination to our vaccine services and sites. So that's, a, 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 I think, a big win. And we, we've heard from many of our partners that that's been a barrier. So we're really glad to see that. Um, and then, of course, um, as people, as our organizations and agencies are opening up more and more, we're seeing folks come back into community, right? We're seeing folks go to food shelves and existing community services. So we're, we're learning that a lot of our partners are putting the information that Ramsey County has developed in food bo boxes. Um, they're having that ability to have that one-on-one -on -one dialogue with community members. So we just wanted to share a brief update on the types of activities that our partners are implementing. And then I think I'll hand it back over to Prince for this update. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Holly. Um, so uh, with regards to uh, the, co the focused vaccine distribution, um, like I mentioned before, for some of our community members, like actually coming to a government building based upon previous trauma, um, people may not want to uh, come to a government building or um, a kind of a county hosted site, so to speak. So we're really working on targeting like pop-up kind of vaccines. Um, right now, it seems that um, a lot of people who really want the vaccine have the vaccine, and there's that um, mental perception around still some people wanting to wait. So one of the pop-up vaccine sites that we hosted was at Allianz Field uh, for the Juneteenth uh, celebration and vaccination event. And want to thank uh, Anika Foundation. We partnered with Culture Wellness Center, Black Nurses Rock, along with our public health department, the House of Refuge, and Sinai Foundation. And at that site, uh, there were about 900 people who had came through like for the event and we had 30 people who got vaccinated um, at that specific event. Um, so that was like one idea of a pop-up site and looking at partnering with our uh, community organizations to do kind of more focused pop-up vaccine sites, looking at salons and barbershops and other places just to be able to reach out into the community where it may not be 30, 40 people, but being able to reach out at one event and being able to get five or six people in a few hours um, and I would say one of the things that we noticed uh, at the Juneteenth event where there were two young men who were, didn't really want to get the vaccine, but they had conversations with some of the nurses at Black Nurses Rock. And those two young men ended up getting vaccinated. And it was just being able to ask questions uh, to other professionals, um, just to be able to get their questions answered. Um, so we wanted to provide an update around the vaccine rates. Um, so when you look at the three zip codes that we targeted uh, back in May 14th, uh, the 55130 was at 47%. And if I'm not mistaken, the bottom numbers are up by 1%. Yes, Prince. So, um, as Deputy County Manager Hadeen mentioned, if you compare May 14th, which you see the percentages here, we've had a, a good increase, I would say, in from that date all the way to um, today around, I think, a 1% increase in the 55130. So, that would be 61%. And then in 55103 and 55106, it's gone up to 64%, as Deputy County Manager mentioned earlier. And we do want to say that we know that many factors, right, have contributed to the increase in vaccination rates. And we want to continue to see that, right, <laughs> especially in certain zip codes, but also just across our community and across our state. But we do want to mention that it's, it's the combined effort of not only our public health department, research, but community that is making this change happen. And so we can't attribute all of this to our, our immediate vaccine efforts with research and public health, but we can attribute it to the long term, I think, in long standing relationships and work that we're doing um, in community. So just kudos to everyone that's contributing to this move. Um, and we want to continue to double down on how we're doing this, right, through cultural messaging and media and our, and our concerted efforts with our connectors and any way that we can see that um, people can really be impacted and, again, to Prince's point, have their questions and concerns answered and then think through um, the best next step for themselves and their families. Um, we do want to mention that um, MGH has recalculated these rates based on eligibility and geocoding. So again, um, just taking that into account, but we want to preface that today that we are seeing progress and we're really hopeful that we continue to see that in our community. So thank you so much for having us. I want to turn it back over to our County Manager O'Connor. I do have a couple of questions, a few, in fact, of load. I'll call on Commissioner Reinhardt. Remind me, please, um, the percentages, are those of all that are eligible or are those adults? Is it 12 and up? 12 and up for the vaccine? For the percentages that you have there? Yes. Yeah. 
Is it, is it the zip code data is actually 16 plus. We 16 get that plus. through NDH. Yes, but the data that you see on our site that talks about all of Ramsey County, right now that's 12 plus. Okay. It is a little confusing. Okay. Well, and that's, I think, especially with um, school starting in uh, about a month and a half at mm -hmm. the most, um, which my eight-year-old granddaughter was just shocked that it was going to be August next month. How did that happen? <laughs> Um, but it is, <laughs> you know, and so just getting ready. And I know that um, if if adults don't think that it's important for them, it's important for the kids because they can't be vaccinated at least at this point. And I'm sure they'll get to a point where you you, you can get vaccinated under 12. But um, you know, the kids in school and younger people are more and more uh, the the people that seem to be uh, impacted the most. And granted, um, you know, for those that are vaccinated, it's, uh, you can still get it, but it's the symptoms and the hospitalization rates are so much less. But I think it's important for people to note that if nothing else, do it for the kids. You know, Madam Chair and Commissioner Reinhardt, I just wanna say one thing, because you, you had stated that uh, if, if adults don't think it's important, um, I think there's a lot of adults who are hesitant but, and they think it's important, but they're not there yet. And so there's lots of reasons that contribute to that hesitancy. Um, we, could, we could name a bunch of not you know, being clear about what's in it, um, historical trauma, connections to, or lack of connection to healthcare systems. There's lots of reasons. And I think there's an importance there because people don't wanna get sick and they don't wanna see their loved ones die. Um, but I just, I just wanted to be thoughtful about the language. I think there definitely could be a population out there that may believe exactly the way you said it, but I just didn't want to uh, make a blanket, blanket and, statement um, for everyone here. And I appreciate you um, calling that out because I wasn't really thinking about it in that way. I was thinking about it as, um, I used the wrong word. It's really what it comes down to. So, I, yes, I don't know anyone that thinks it's truly not important, but whether or not they feel comfortable with it, and I hope that they can get to the point of feeling comfortable with it um, for the kids. And thank you for the work that's being done to correct misinformation, to get good information out and to help people get their questions answered. Commissioner McDonough. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, a quick comment. I want to appreciate um, the education component because that's a big role for public health. And I think all of you mentioned the education piece because we're at that point in time, right? It's not just about availability and making sure people know where we're at or how to, how to get there, helping them get there, but really that education piece for all the reasons, Kathy, you talked about. And that's going to be kind of the work moving forward to continue to rise the numbers. Your last slide was exactly where, I, you know, Kathy, I think you know I ask you this question every meeting and you get a little frustrated sometimes. But that last slide, um, actually just one more level deeper, right? So early on, the gap between kind of the general population was significant. And I know we've done a lot of, and those are really good numbers and thanks to everybody, you know, for getting us all those zip codes over 60. And I know we've always had kind of this goal of 70, but I also want to look at the gap, right? Are, is the gap, you know, are we closing the gap? Is the gap consistent or are we losing ground? And I think that's also a big piece of the equity piece. It's not just raising the numbers, but making sure we're getting these communities so that the numbers, the gap is less and maybe someday we don't even have a gap, right? Yeah, Madam Chair, Commissioner. Uh, McDonough, you're right. We are um, the the gap is closing, and if you if you take a look at the maps and you look at them week to week, you'll see that some of our highest um, zip codes haven't moved uh, much. Uh, five five one zero five, I think, is at eighty three percent. One one was it what's Highland? This is where I'm. Uh, I need help from other people. Thank you. Five five one one six, I think, has stayed steady around eighty four eighty five percent. Um, so the, some of the northern suburbs um, also kind of staying steady while these other suburbs are increasing. So, or the other suburbs, the other zip codes are increasing. So the gap is, um, is definitely uh, shrinking over time, which is good. Good, thank you. Thanks for your work. Commissioner Ortega, and then I think we'll be moving on. <laughs> thank you for your good work. My question is very similar to the, to the one Victoria 
if we look at those, uh, that population, that segment that, that cannot be vaccinated. So if I look at everybody, let's say ages three or four to 12, that are in need of childcare or in school, but not vaccinated, given what we're seeing with the variant, what is the potential, what is the thinking, or even just a general discussion? I'm not interested in what we just talked about. I'm now focusing on that particular segment of having a spike in that population or a transmission to a point Madam Thank Chair, you. Commissioner Ortega, I think it's a really good point. Um, Dr. Ogawa is on a much needed vacation visiting family right now, and she would have a, probably a really great answer for this. <laughs> but it's really important for us to continue to message masking. You know, I can't tell you the number of times I've been in um, uh, grocery stores and seen small children without masks on. They're not vaccinated. There's, you know, they're, they're still um, the group of people who are unfortunately mostly asymptomatic and still able to um, pass the virus on to other people. Um, and so we, we need to continue to stay vigilant and um, talking about the need to make sure that we're protecting young people just like we're protecting older people um, and continuing to talk about vaccine and continuing to message and connect through our trusted messengers and our uh, community connectors and our media messengers uh, to ensure that that population who, who aren't eligible for vaccine at this time, hopefully soon, hopefully September, um, uh, but they need to continue to mask and we, gotta, we, we need to keep talking about that. Well, and that's a little bit to my point. Well, I'm saying what we're doing now is critically important. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're about 45 days away from school starting. Mm -hmm. And, and, and when, that's why I'm asking what is the thinking, the discussion internally. You know, I, 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 I mean, it, it says, I understand that science is not there yet. So, but in terms of vac vaccinating younger kids and so forth, but somewhere along the line with the messaging, you know, mm -hmm. is it really important to go from 80 to 81% or 82 or 83 when we have our youngest, most vulnerable, 100% exposed? It is, it is, it's really important. And I think and, messaging- And the masking and all of that, when do we pivot to that kind of message? I, I'm just sort of brainstorming. I think we have to do that very soon. And I also think that um, research, when we launched our Mask for Everyone initiative, we're actually in talks with um, Senior Commander um, Anderson, Laura Anderson, about do we now do have an influx of youth and children's masks, right, as we prepare for the school year. So that's something that we're already planning for. We've actually started meeting about that with our mask planning team around how do we reach um, youth, children, and families, and parents in preparation for the school year. So we continue, and community, I know you're out there listening, but a mask for everyone is still active. Um, you, we can still take your requests, and if we um, see an influx in children or youth mask requests, we can accommodate that, and we want community to know that. Um, masks are not cheap, right? <laughs> there may be an influx of availability now, but I really think it's important that we continue messaging around masking up for our children that can't get the vaccine. So I think that's, again, to Dr. Ogawa, which I, I can channel her right now, hearing her that vaccine is, is, is the best way, right? But also, if you can't get vaccinated or if you're too young, please wear a mask, please social distance, please you know, don't go to large gatherings. I mean, the same messaging that we had early on, we need to reactivate in so many different ways for our, our children and our young people. So thank you for, for lifting that up, Commissioner Ortega. Well, that's exactly right. I'm just saying we gotta, we don't want to wait till the week of school to start pivoting to that message. Uh, right, and uh, Commissioner Ortega, we are, our partnership with schools continues. So we continue to meet with them and work with them. You know, their summer programs and discovery clubs, the, the children still mask. So they're aware of the population that they have, right? And understand their role in helping to protect families um, as well too. And so all of our districts have been great partners and we continue to be, uh, to work with them as well. And childcare. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's yep. not the school yep. system. That's right. Yes. And yep. that talking about hitting the populations. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. The, impact, the potential negative impact in the communities that we know need to to be, you know, where the issue is greater. 
Yes, yes, yes. good reminders, thank you. And of course, it, it's not just the young people either. It's the mm -hmm. adults who work with, with the young them. people exactly. who are in our schools. And so with administrative weeks coming up and training and the first day of school, this is a great time to be planning that partnership. Thank you, Commissioner Ortega. Prince, and Madam Chair and Commissioner Ortega, um, so these are conversations that we have been having like with research, uh, knowing about like our children. A big focus over the past couple months has been like the vaccine and understanding that once, um, like after getting all of this out, that is the next focus that we are looking at and being able to have conversations with parents. I was meeting with a staff person who works with a lot of our young adults in a certain program and they were sharing that parents aren't getting vaccinated because they're hearing about the side effects and they don't have anyone to take care of their kids during that time. So these are the conversations and working through some of those issues. So we are taking that feedback back. Thank okay. you. Thank you very, very much. And what a team reporting here from communications, our racial and health equity administration, public health, our new director, and of course our health and wellness Deputy, thank you so much for all of the work that you all are doing, and I'm so thankful that Dr. Ogawa has the opportunity to have a little time down. We look forward to seeing her back here with you. I'll turn back to the county manager, in case there are any final comments here. Madam Chair, just a few, I think, I am hopeful, um, we haven't talked about this a ton, I'm hopeful that in similar ways to 12 plus, when we extended there, that different parents then came in with whole family approaches to getting vaccinated, that we'll see a similar bump up when you go to four plus or whatever it becomes. So there's a fingers crossed element, not everyone's kids are 12, right? And so hopefully that becomes part of it. Um, these investments that uh, Director Sicklin was talking about today when he highlighted the dollar amounts came from CARES and funding in the past and the way in which we established that money here with all of you. We had continued to do work around thinking about ARP and the longer term strategy. I don't think the focus, the equity based focus around COVID and coming out of it and the recovery ends now with the vaccination effort. So more to come in that space, but it continues. The trust in government is so tough to earn right now. And the one thing that has been very clear is it's gone up from those with whom we've worked under partnership through contracts. It's gone up with members of our own staff who see the results happen and across the community. And that's been one of the uplifting pieces. Someone said to me yesterday, you know, I've had a chance to work with Ramsey County through this and I'm now able to talk about the work happening here in a way that in the past I just couldn't. And that's made a big difference. And this is someone who carries that message to places that we may not otherwise get. And finally, I just think it's important to repeat is these equity focused strategies matter because the trend that we are seeing of rising vaccination rates is not happening everywhere. Many places have stalled out. And when, when we focus on ensuring that everyone has access, everyone is being talked to, everyone finds a way to be a part of everyone, we see the entire community benefit in all ways. And I just wanted to go back and highlight that. It's been great work from that team. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the update. We won't neglect to end with a moment of meditation, then we'll be moving on. We've got lots of work to do yet this morning, uh, including a workshop on our CARES work and racial equity community response. So let's take that moment of meditation. My apologies that our moment is not 60 seconds, <laughs> you know, as we move through, but just a moment to continue to reflect on the ongoing health and social and economic and even political unrest that continues in our land and that we are working diligently to put behind us so that we can move on uh, to that better community that we all want. So we are moving to our administrative agenda. I'll call on Commissioner Ortega. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move item number four, amendment to Soul Source Agreement with Environmental Systems Research Institute. Item number five, grant awards from the Minnesota Department of Human Services for housing support infrastructure and personal complement increase in the housing stability. Item number seven, 
terms of collective bargaining, bargaining agreement with Chiefs of Street 20 Correctional Officers. Item number eight, terms of collective bargaining agreement with Law Enforcement Labor Service Number 423, Deputy Sheriffs for the year 2021. Num item number nine, Terms of Collective Bargaining Agreement with Law Enforcement Labor Services, number 353, Emergency Communications. Item number 10, Appointment to the Workforce Innovation Board of Ramsey County. Second. Second. Thank you, there's a motion and a second. We appreciate all the work that is represented. Um, we are moving forward here today with a yes vote. There is no number six, and so it was not an era uh, as we read from five to seven. So, <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on the items? Appreciate that. We'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Ortega? Aye. Reinhardt? Aye. Stratham? Aye. Maris Castillo? McDonough? Aye. McGuire? Aye. Carter? Aye. And thank you very much. Those items have all passed. We are moving on to the legislative agenda. Commissioner McGuire. Thank you, Madam Chair. And we all know that the legislative session is over. Uh, although the legislators continue to work and we continue to work with them, uh, our committee will continue, our, our team will continue to meet weekly of Commissioner Mattis Castillo and myself and, and Government Relations Department of Jennifer O'Rourke and Melissa Finnegan and then our, our consultants, uh, Government Relations people will continue to meet because we are, you know, preparing for the upcoming session already. But, um, so, but we'll probably be taking this off the agenda unless there's a specific uh, thing that we need to talk about. So um, uh, this will be my last uh, regular report, but uh, I'll be keeping you posted on how things are going. But with that, I will um, just talk about a couple of things that are going on. Uh, there's a COVID-related frontline worker pay work, working group that um, you maybe read about in the press. State legislators are coming together in this group to decide how to allocate 250 million uh, to around 250,000 workers across the state. Uh, this work will be done in early September uh, for a possible special session where this money uh, would be allocated in a bill. So our, our own Senator um, Murphy from Ramsey County was, serves on this committee. And if you have any questions, we, you know, we can talk to her. Um, our government relations staff are working with human resources and others to keep track of the employment law issues. So uh, just to let you know that that's there. And on the federal front, we have heard affirmatively from Representative McCollum's office that uh, both, both the Bruce Vento Trail and a community violence prevention project are both in the House Appropriations Package. Uh, Re Congresswoman McCollum has succeeded in getting about 12 million in projects for cities, nonprofits, community groups, and these two county projects in, within her district. So we're really grateful to Congresswoman McCollum for, for her work in that appropriations process. So I know that both Chair Carter and Commissioner Reinhardt have provided, provided quotes to her office last week. So we know it's the, it's the personal connections that, that we have with her that we really do, that we really do appreciate. And I will just say that, um, you know, as I said, our work with the, with the legislators continues as, as meetings will be going on now to talk to them about what they're thinking of uh, this year and next. And also, um, you know, they're, as they have questions about how we're allocating our CARES and our, and our American Rescue Plan dollars, that um, we're probably gonna have a couple of Zoom, Zoom meetings with them just to keep them posted on things. So we'll keep you posted on when those would happen. And um, we, we, they are, um, we're just grateful for the connections that we have with our, our Ramsey County delegation team. So uh, thanks to everyone for all their work. Thank you, Commission McGuire, and kudos to you and to Commissioner Menes Castillo for keeping us updated. We know um, how much we've benefited from your work and also from our legislative team. team right. um, just a lot of thanks for that. And we know that the work continues beyond this moment, although things don't change as much week to week as during the legislative session. So we look forward to hearing as necessary. 
we'll uh, ask the county manager for my connections. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioners, just one update. We'll do the weekly state fair update. Um, so the work continues with the State Agricultural Society on the Joint Powers Agreement, the indemnification and liability language. There's been progress made in that space. I, I think it's fair to say optimistic around how uh, that language has come together. We've been doing, in partnership with the Ag Society and Finance, a review of assets from the State Fair. Um, alongside the continued work around the private insurance market that the Ag Society is doing to secure their liability insurance. And it's a mix between the liability insurance being large enough and ensuring that assets exist in case something were to go beyond whatever that limit is. That remains the piece we are working through. Uh, the chair spoke yesterday with the commissioner of admin as a part of the updates going on. I want to give a shout out to the county attorney's office and civil division director Sam Clark for his work in this space to continue to drive hard at this work. Um, and we're continuing to make progress. It's, it's, a, it's a challenging piece to it. I think these questions for the state also brought to the fore their need to reevaluate their own risk uh, completely irrespective of who is doing that operation, right, and where it fits in the state's own portfolio. And that's actually been a complicating factor, but we continue to make progress and um, more to come in the days ahead. Madam Chair, I don't know if you want to add anything to that from where you sit. I think you did a pretty good job. I would just uh, stay encouraged that the work, everyone is leaning in and together from our Ramsey County side. And just thank you so much to the County Attorney's Office, Sam Clark. Thank you for your brilliance and work in the past week because we have come a long way uh, to the County Manager for your attention. The Sheriff is leaning in and working together with us in agreement. And so I believe that we will very shortly be able to update you on this and move forward. Um, we have outside board and committee reports. And I'll start that with Commissioner Reinhardt. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to first report on two things that are local and then, of course, uh, turn to the National Association of Counties Conference. Um, the policy advisory committee for uh, the Rush Line corridor, which is no longer Rush Line. <laughs> it is now the Purple Line. <laughs> um, so, yes. <laughs> we got the color. Very pleased. Um, I mean, we're still calling it Rush Line, but it has officially received, received its color now. Um, and I, it, this is likely the last uh, policy advisory committee meeting. Unless something unusual happens, um, this was, the, it completed the work of the PAC. And I thanked um, Mayor Jo Emerson um, for chairing this. Um, she has decided not to run for re-election, and so I wanted to make sure that she got the recognition that she deserves um, in trying to work through um, the myriad of issues that are there. And, um, and again, uh, I think if the pe for the people that are listening, we really want all of the community input. We also want to be able to provide information because there are a lot of, there's a lot of misinformation, unfortunately, out there. Um, and we have facts and, and, you know, the science and the engineers behind things that have done this across the world. <laughs> Um, that are doing the work here for Ramsey County um, and Rush Lane. And so, you know, getting the information, and I would say, you know, most people really want to have the information, especially if there are concerns, and with any change, there's always concern. So, but as I have pointed out to um, folks that have contacted me, again, appreciating the, the people that are for and against, and just, you know, reaching out is really important in getting that input. But I have um, lived in White Bear Lake, actually very close to the northern terminus, um, for over 45 years. Raised my family. Um, now my grandchildren <laughs> are there going to the schools, and there's concern about the school and how the buses are going to have a, make a change there. But the one thing, over those 45 years, or 46 years actually, um, there's been a lot of change in White Bear Lake. <laughs> And, but the one thing that has never changed about that community, and I think because it has such strong community ties, because it has been around for so long, there's history there, there's a downtown, there's all these things, um, is the resilience. I mean, it um, 
has changed so much, but it has never lost that, that cultural small town feel to it. And I am confident that um, it will not change if it can go through some of the other changes that have taken place. Um, so I feel really um, very confident in that, that um, the, especially the concern about changing the culture of the community. It takes, a bus line isn't going to change the culture of a community. So, um, at least that's my opinion. <laughs> so I, but it's, it's really nice to have this part complete and I know that this isn't a rail authority meeting but I because of the significance of it I wanted to make sure to bring it up here so there's still work to be done obviously before it totally transitions to Metro Council um, which is expected probably in um, October or so of this year and um, we go forward from there lots of questions still need to be answered lots of um, assessments about ridership and and all the things that go into this um, because at this point we're at about 25%. That means there's a lot still to be determined or re-examined as we go forward. Um, so I just wanted to make sure and let everyone know what was happening there. We take everything seriously. We make sure we get the information out and, um, and really are working with the community. Um, also, the, another thing that is transit related is um, I was there for the um, grand opening of the Lake Lynx Trail Walgamot Way. Um, Steve Walgamot has been just a uh, stalwart as far as getting the Lake Lynx complete and we're close, we're not quite there yet. But it was fun to be there um, and to celebrate the, some of those connections that are taking place. So I wanted to do a call out there. Um, Senator Chuck Weger was there and others were there as well. But Senator Weger has been really strong in support for the funding for Lake Lynx. Um, so those are the two things um, from, that are local. National Association of Counties. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Commissioner McGuire, um, I, uh, we are so proud. Can we take a moment to just clap our hands? Yes. <laughs> And we'll let you finish the announcement, Commissioner. Um, winning, earning the uh, position of second vice president for the National Association of Counties is not a small feat. And I know that there were a lot of people, and you are going to be talking about that, but I have honestly never seen such a positive campaign in all the years that I've gone to NACO. Um, everything was talking about the future and about the changes that um, you want to bring and the positivity that you're bringing to the work that we do as counties. And that's what won the day, was the work that you have done and will continue to do. So, <laughs> um, the other things that happened there um, that I would like to highlight is I have spoken before about the environmental justice uh, mapping and uh, a resolution was passed at the legislative conference. It has now become part of the NACO platform. And so it is um, such a critical thing and it's not just about environmental justice and it's not just about this mapping project. It is overall looking at um, justice issues throughout our platform. And so it was really heartwarming to see that um, become part of our platform and not just a resolution. Um, not that you, just a resolution isn't good, but um, in this particular case, I think it's so over, um, it, it's the base from which we work and it, it affects everything. Um, I was able to, um, on a unanimous vote out of the Environment, Energy, and Land Use Committee, and the commissioners here will understand just how significant that is. <laughs> There's very few things the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative that Congresswoman McCollum is um, the author of and that will help with really the Mississippi River from uh, the Delta to the Basin. And it's, it's so incredibly important, the number, well, the worldwide economy and what happens along that river and some of the things that need to be done. So it was great to get that passed. 
And then um, there was also, and I think um, I want to mention it here, but I want to wait until Commissioner Modest Castillo is back to really talk about it, and that is uh, proclaiming uh, gun violence as a public health crisis. Um, and she was a, a major person in making that happen. So there were other things that happened, but we, and not only did we elect the greatest <laughs> second by VP of NACO, um, but we also got some really important work done in all of our different committees and, and how we moved forward with it. So it, um, all in all, was just one of the best NACO conferences <laughs> I've ever been to. And it was nice to see people in person and have the virtual option as well, especially for some of the counties that um, are, are more in the rural um, areas where it's more difficult to get to conferences like this. So that is it. I know it was a long one, but um, I, again, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing Commissioner McGuire. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. And before I go to Commissioner Fretham, who is next, I would just add that the success of Commissioner McGuire in this election at the National Association of Counties is due to the work that all of you put in. You know, it was certainly a team work, um, a team effort, I should say. And the positive momentum of your campaign, led, of course, by your own work and objectives, was illustrated, I think, by this team. 78% of the vote at a national <laughs> conference where there are multiple folks running was not shabby <laughs> at all on the first vote. Congratulations. And I'll go to Commissioner Fretham. Thank you, and my congratulations Thank to Commissioner you. McGuire as well. I'm sorry I wasn't there with you, but uh, in there, there in spirit. Um, and thank you, Commissioner Reinhardt, for your update on the Purple Line. Um, I, I think we can all share our appreciation for the city of White Bear Lake. I got to uh, enjoy some paddle boarding on White Bear Lake uh, last week, and it's just such a beautiful area. And I don't think any of us want to do anything that would compromise it. And so our, our advocacy for Purple Line is, is not about changing anything there because it's wonderful. It's about making sure there's access for people um, and different ways to get around there. Uh, and uh, so my update, uh, I really want to thank our social services team here at Ramsey County for letting, that, letting me join them at the Pride booth on Saturday morning. I had such a wonderful time talking with people and sharing information about becoming uh, a foster care family or adoptive family with Ramsey County, our inclusive practices and the, the challenges that some of our youth face in the foster care environment, especially our youth who are identified identifies LGBTQ2S+. Um, so thank you to everyone who was there who, who worked with me and, and helped me at the booth and for everyone I got to speak to and for all the folks who spent their weekend at Pride sharing information about Ramsey County and our wonderful work. Uh, I, we also had an extension committee meeting, and I just want to share that I'm, I'm new to this committee. They do great work, Ramsey County Extension. Um, I got to sign up for their, they're doing monthly kits for families with young kids, and so my daughter and I got to play with polymers and make rainbow <laughs> windows, and every day she has to go and squish them some more. Um, but I'm also really impressed by the work of our appointees on this committee who are working and thinking long term about the work of the committee and how they can better integrate with the goals of Ramsey County, how they can get their message out to more people in the community. So just really impressed with the work that's happening um, there. And then finally, just wanting to let uh, folks know, I, I know there, the, the decision in the Rice Creek Commons lawsuit came out a couple of weeks ago. I've spent some time thinking about that. And I uh, wanted to let you all know that I'll be sending a letter today. You'll each receive one, as well as leaders in Arden Hills and some community members who've expressed interest that um, because since I, before I launched my campaign, this has been in litigation, I haven't been able to really talk openly with the community. So I'm hosting some dialogue circles in Arden Hills. Uh, so this isn't a presentation or a persuasive speech, but just an opportunity to get to know and speak with residents of Arden Hills and hear about their experiences and what they love about their community and what they see as the future of their community. Um, you are all invited to join us. We just ask uh, everyone to work with my office and my aide to ensure that we don't violate any open meeting laws. But I'll be getting out more information today on that. So I just wanted to give you all a heads up and I have worked closely with uh, my team as well as uh, a couple of my colleagues here and some of our staff at Ramsey County to ensure that um, 
everything is, is by the book and in order and that this really is an opportunity for listening and learning in my community. So uh, thank you for all the work you've done thus far on this issue. I know it's, it has been um, a long and sometimes very painful process for everyone involved. And for me, I really want to think about how do we move forward uh, in the most positive and future-oriented way. So that's all I have today for my update. Thank you, Commissioner Fretham, and also for enduring this process with us, with all of us in our community. We appreciate your encouragement for this conversation and this opportunity to talk together moving forward. Thank you very much. Um, let me see. Alphabetically, that would be Commissioner McDonough. <laughs> Thanks, Madam Chair. I'll have two brief updates. One, um, I've reported um, back a couple of times. I, I rep I'm a the Association of Minnesota Counties rep on the state uh, transportation policy group. Every five years, MnDOT re reviews its goals and, and, and looks to the future. And I was fortunate to do it five years ago, and the conversation this time around is significantly different, and I give MnDOT leadership a, a lot of credit here. And what, what I mean by that is really bringing in the equity conversation about where we place infrastructure, how we place infrastructure, where we don't place infrastructure, and the impact it has. We need infrastructure. It's an act part of the economic driver in our community. We need to move people and goods. But we all know the history, right? I mean, we live with it here in Ramsey County, and when, when infrastructure is put in, in a way where it doesn't take a look at the needs and interests of all people, and, in, in, and I'm talking about 94, I don't need to mention that, everybody's shaking their heads, but we also can demonstrate when we do this right, how it works, and uh, at our HRA meeting, we're gonna approve some environmental response funds for a affordable housing project on Payne Avenue, which is at the intersection of Phelan Boulevard, which was the first brand new road St. Paul put in in over 50 years. And I was a part of leading that effort, but that, that infrastructure investment was designed to bring um, equity, it was designed to service a community that needed stronger um, infrastructure for, you know, getting to work, getting to school, but also as that economic driver. And if, I think most of you had shared a lunch with me at Ward 6, yeah. um, which is right there, and, and it's mm -hmm. been wonderful to see the transformation of that intersection. We've still got a couple more lots there, but this housing project that we're gonna fund here, or hopefully we're gonna fund here, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself, but it, it's, it's amazing. So if you're out and about and you have an opportunity, drive through that intersection, or go have lunch at Ward 6. They're open and they're ready to go, and they, Eric serves great food there. But I just wanted to take a moment to, to point out that these things, all this is not siloed, right? And that's part of the voice I bring to the policy committee is, that these, there's this interconnection on how we build our community with community, and it, it can work, and we got great examples of that, but we can fail community many times when we're not doing that, and we can still demonstrate that today, not just looking back and pointing to the past. We still are making mistakes. We are still leaving community out, um, but we're getting better at it. And I just wanted to uh, give MnDOT some recognition because as a, a big bureaucracy that we all deal with, in some ways we think that they're tone deaf and they're not there, but they are. They really are opening up and, and being accepting of you know the, the history, but also wanting to be a part of the solution moving forward. The other uh, update I'll give you briefly is we had the Metropolitan Emergency Service Board. As I look around the table, Probably most commissioners, Commissioner Fretham, you haven't had the opportunity, but you will. You will. Because we kind of rotate through that one, just like mosquito control. But I bring it up because it's one of those joint powers agreements that kind of operates under the surface, but it operates so well. And that's why, right? We've got seven counties in the city of Minneapolis. It really is the backbone of ensuring that our 911 center and all of the 911 centers in the metropolitan area are up to date, we're thinking about the future, how we can manage calls, how we can serve folks that are calling in and how to best serve the folks that we're dispatching out to, right? First responders, uh, public safety folks, fire folks. And as we expand that group of people, of who are the potential responders, mm -hmm. mental health people, you know, there's, you know, we've got the three kind of big ones, but we're, we're, we're having conversations and that Joint Powers Board is having those same kind of conversations. With, 
how we can be prepared as we continue to move. So I just wanted to bring that up. We don't talk about a lot. Uh, Commissioner Madison Steele's been on there. She, yeah. She's the past chair of that group. And, and, and uh, but we don't talk a lot about it because it works <laughs> and it's working well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Commissioner McDonough, for all of your comments about where we've been and where we're going. Mm -hmm. Mark's transformation. Uh, Commissioner McGuire. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to give my local report first, and then I'll talk about the national uh, event. Um, Ward 6 is a great place to eat. Thank you for bringing me there. They always have such a great special. I'm like, okay, I'm ready to, I'm ready to go back. I totally, I totally want to go back to that restaurant. So thank you for, for bringing me there in the first place, Commissioner McDonough. And um, I, uh, after NACO, I got back to AMC, had a new commissioner's school. So there's lots of new commissioners in the state of Minnesota that are raring to really help out county government. And it's really um, great to meet with all of them. Uh, also, our Child Care Policy Action Group uh, presented at our St. Paul Children's Collaborative, and so Jennifer Schuster Yeager and December uh, presented on the work that we're doing on early childhood, and uh, it's very exciting, and at some point I know we're going to have a workshop here where we can, you know, um, just see all the, all the great work that that, that that action group started and the work that's continuing on now with that, and so I know that the Children's Collaborative was really appreciative of that. Uh, Commissioner Fretham already mentioned our Extension Committee. I, I just agree with everything she said about how great uh, they, they are, the, the appointees are doing and, and how they're wanting to move forward, and it's, it's a, a also, contrib you know, also a part of our restructuring that we have, and they're working with, with Director Sickfeland, you know, and really making sure that they're a part of Ramsey County and what they're doing. And so it's just fun to see how our service team model just really reaches out to all of these entities. So um, it is, it's fun to, to be a part of that extension group. So um, with that, I do want to just take a couple minutes, Madam Chair, to, to comment on the amazing event that did just happen at, at our National Association of Counties. And I, I, I consider it a group effort win. It was really uh, a, team, a team win. It was a win for Ramsey County, uh, a win for the state of Minnesota, uh, a tribute to all of us, you know, uh, in our work that we've continued to do throughout NACO. NACO is uh, an organization that is better because of the work of Ramsey County commissioners. and. Um, and we, and it, you could feel it. I mean, we ran a campaign on leading together. I'm wearing the badge that we all had. You can see we had little bracelets that people wore because it is about being a, a team and, and getting our work done together. So when I was uh, lucky enough to be campaigning for this and talking to a lot of people, it was a constant, oh, well, if Commissioner McDonough, if Commissioner Carter, Reinhardt, Ortega, if they're for you, then I am too. I mean, you could just feel the work that Ramsey County has done in this in this organization, and I just can't say you know thank you enough. But the work, I will say, the work is going to continue because with this uh, new position that we have, I will say that it's it's going to be um, our our challenge to really maximize this effort that we have to have a national platform to really bring the great work that Ramsey County is doing to you know to the national level and uh, and really benefit from what we can from that national exposure i will say that our association of minnesota counties had an amazing impact as well we all know julie ring our executive director is a rock star and so does the rest of the country uh, and all of those state associations uh, really believe in her and her work and they were uh, the association was really instrumental in helping with this uh, campaign as well and um, so I just want to give special shout out to Commissioner McDonough. I chaired my weekly advisory group meetings. Commissioner Carter served on that. Commissioner Mattis Castillo actually chaired my logistics team that really did so much of the, of the work of the campaign. I want to thank my colleagues, Commissioner Reinhardt and Fretham and Ortega for, for their support and just your your total dedication to the effort. It was so great. And then, you know, our commissioner's assistant, Ethan, Darren, Matt, Ken, were just right there for the whole, for all the work. There was such great energy around that booth. It was amazing to behold that we would be the place where people really wanted to be. They wanted to be around uh, the, the people that were working on this campaign. And I could feel it. And so I, I just um, 
want to say thank you. Our work is, uh, is to be done now uh, as far as uh, making this the best uh, effort that we can make, and I'm not. I'm not surprised. I, I'm not. I, I, I'm confident that Ramsey County will totally rise to the occasion, and I'm just looking forward to, you know, continuing to work with with all of you and our great staff. Oh my gosh, um, that will be that will be on the on the uh, that will be highlighted at the national level now. And so thank you, everyone. Uh, everyone that helped had something to do with this, and there were many community members and many organizations that really helped with this effort as well. So um, thank you for that. Thank you, Madam Chair, for, for letting me you know, really um, give, give tribute to the people that really, made this, that really made this happen. I was just honored to be a part of the, of the journey and uh, look forward to continue the years ahead that the four-year commitment that we make that will bring us all uh, greater um, exposure and greater work that, that can come our way. So, and thank you very much for your <laughs> thank you all. Mm -hmm. Effort, energy, and effectiveness. Yes, thank you. And and it was positive energy. I'll tell you, people are ready. People are ready for positivity in this country Indeed. and coming together. I'll say one more thing, Madam Chair. With some, I'm beginning lots of congratulations that really are for all of us. But um, one some person said, I, "It's rare to see a person that really gets the respect of of all people that of both sides of the aisle, of, of, of everyone trying to come together." And you seem to be one of those rare. Uh, and I'm going to call it rare efforts that we all made. It was a total group effort that we are really about serving all of our people. And that really resonated with people. Well so, said. That was it. Thank you. Commissioner Ortega. Madam Chair, all I have to say right now <laughs> is <laughs> congratulations to Mary Jo. She is, quite frankly, the, and I told her this uh, when she first asked me about uh, about uh, starting this effort, I think she is the right person for the right uh, for the right time. Uh, just because of her personal attitude and and positiveness, uh, so uh, you're gonna be you're gonna do great. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. And I know we we are pressing on. Um, toward a next two meetings. So I will just end by saying we are in a position, we have been exercising leadership and will now be even able to enhance that leadership with our, um, with our second vice president at the National Association of Counties. I was invited also to participate in this last conference in a new organization of equity leaders for the National Association of Counties. I want to thank Ramsey County leaders, mm -hmm. um, certainly our health, our racial and health equity administrators, our new director of public health for helping to elevate in a request from the um, a, Administration for Children and Families, ACF at a national level, the work that we've been doing around equity during the pandemic and focusing beyond, and also our Economic Development Director and Workforce Director who will be participating in a panel upcoming, a national panel. But this is now with the new equity platform that the National Association of Counties has developed with our encouragement, mm -hmm. a new opportunity for us to connect the racial equity and community engagement work that we're doing to this national platform where they will be supporting administrators across the country, engaging ideas, sharing ideas, and lifting up new platforms for equity throughout the nation. I know that you will anticipate our leadership there. I look forward to connecting the county manager and other leaders here um, to that work on an ongoing basis. So with that, we are moving beyond this board meeting to a Housing and Redevelopment Authority meeting, which will be held here immediately, chaired by Commissioner um, Reinhardt. And then we have a county board workshop on our CARES evaluation for food and basic needs during coronavirus, and also our racial health, our racial equity and community engagement response team projects. And that will continue in the chambers following our HRA meeting. With that, this meeting of the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners is adjourned. <laughs>